name is Esther Chu, and I am the first year chair for the Oregon Cannabis Commission. Um, I just want to start by um, asking for approval of the minutes from the last meeting, last commission meeting. If you want to take a second to look them over, then I will make a motion to approve them. If you could all turn in your binders to 2198, I just want to start this meeting. This is uh, There's a lot of meat in this meeting, so I just want to anchor us uh, by going back to the, the mission for this Cannabis Commission, so I'll read the main uh, three points. So, um, the original uh, language for the goals of our commission, it's that the, the Oregon Cannabis Commission shall determine, A, a possible framework for the future governance of the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program including proper oversight and regulation. I'll speed through some of the details. Um, necessary amendments to the laws of the state pertaining to cannabis. Um, the future role of the commission with respect to the possible framework. Um, we also shall determine steps that the state must take, whether administrative or legislative in nature, to ensure that research on cannabis and cannabis-derived products is being conducted for public purposes, including the advancement of public health policy and public safety policy, agronomic and horticultural best practices, and medical and pharmacopoeia best practices. Um, and then finally, uh, the commission shall report in a manner, in, shall submit a report in a manner uh, prescribed by ORS 192.245 to the interim subcommittees of the Legislative Assembly related to health and judiciary on the findings and determinations made by the commission. Um, those are the main points A, B, and C. Um, so let's just stay anchored in that as we sort of work through uh, the reports of the subcommittees. So uh, we're going to move directly into the meat of this meeting. Um, and so uh, for those of you who have been following along, we um, decided that given the breadth of this uh, commission and our objectives that we would split up into four working groups or subcommittees. Um, these are product integrity, uh, research, um, education and training, and uh, patient access. So our subcommittees have been working very hard. Um, we've had separate meetings that um, uh, have been uh, productive and very interesting um, and have drawn from expertise around the states. Um, so today is where we come back. The goals for this session were that we outline the recommendations made by each subcommittee um, that fall within their purview. I know there will be some overlap in content. Um, and then get feedback from the entire commission uh, about those recommendations, um, how well they fit under the objectives of this commission, um, and how practical and feasible they are. Um, I've been actually giving monthly reports to the governor's office, um, and I will just say um, a couple of points of feedback is uh, we are advised to please be um, focused on the feasible, um, not to um, be too pie in the sky, um, because I think they would like recommendations that we can actually implement that move us forward. Um, that are not so lofty that they are wonderful, but nothing will change. Um, they uh, also do want us to evaluate the framework uh, of the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program and make recommendations specifically about that framework. Um, so that the framework piece doesn't fall under any of our four subcommittees, um, but we do have a, um, a separate section at the end of the individual subcommittee reports. Um, so that may or may not um, be something that we can address within this meeting. So we'll either put it, tag it on at the end of this meeting or we'll start with it on our next commission meeting. Okay. Any questions about what we need to accomplish today? I have one comment. Uh, in 2198, Section 6 also provides a couple of long, a uh, couple of um, things sure. this committee has to take into account, which is develop a long term strategy, strategic planning for ensuring that cannabis will remain therapeutic and also affordable. Thank you. And then I do have one question. Could you repeat the last part of that? two-part thing from the governor's office, focus on feasible LPs. Make, make a comment for how the OMMP is structured, sort of like the, the framework of the OMMP. Um, consider other models, like um, should um, should the um, the structure, uh, the, way, the way the OMMP be run, should that be housed under the same roof as, um, as the administration of the recreational cannabis program? Um, so the report that the staff pulled for us 
pulled together for us. We'll look at some other models from other states, just so that we can run through the exercise of seeing whether there might be a different model that um, would serve our OMMP patients better. Um, I, I think it's, you know, it may be that we review all those models and we consider pros and cons and we end up with what we have. Um, but, uh, but they want us to sort of go through that discussion and be thoughtful about what would serve patients the best. Well, we have to keep in mind that Oregon has been the national standard for the last decade at least, so it's always good to review and see what we can add to our program, but we've been a preeminent program that a lot of states have modeled their programs after ours. Yeah, I think the big question is in this new world of uh, recreational cannabis, is there any argument for housing both under one roof? And I would not say, a critique of yeah, the even though I know we don't want to go there, if we had started out that way. But by ushering adult use under the OLCC, I, I don't think we're going to see a medical model go under the OLCC. Uh, so, um, <laughs> we're already talking about this issue, I think we're going to talk about it later, but yeah. I, I just wanted to make the point that um, what's been in effect in Oregon for 20 years is the medical card program, which is a little bit different than dispensary. So, when you think about the Oregon medical marijuana program, it's not just sort of one, I mean, it is one program, but there are a number of different aspects. So, it might be with some aspects. So, for example, laboratory regulation a lot of that. We, I mean, we work closely, obviously, with OLCC, but I just want to, it may not be all or nothing. Um, so just when we think about it, um, cards are a little bit different than dispensaries are a little bit different than, you know, a number of things that fall under the medical and or the retail programs. Yeah, I think we're sort of under like turn every rock phase, you know, is there, are there any gains to be had anywhere here for patients? Um, can we be innovative um, or at least go through the process of thinking through things that don't feel intuitive? So but there's two, there's two issues there, right? There's the administration and the regulatory side, which could be housed under one roof. I, I honestly have never understood why any state would, would opt for a dual model. Doesn't make sense to me in my mind. Um, but I think the care of patients is a, is a little bit different. I think it, they, they definitely engage with one another. But I think to your point, Katrina, and yours also, Esther, they're, 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 they're sort of separate. And we're, gonna have, we're going to have to tease them apart separately and see where we can bring them back together. It, um, I may, it was the intent of this commission to keep those two programs separate. There is some room for um, combining some of the things, of course, packaging and labeling, testing. Those sorts of things can definitely, and already do serve both both communities. But um, we formed this commission to make sure there was a bright line for everybody between medical and recreational. And um, it's going to be problematic to really try and merge those two into the same agency. Um, not that it can't be done, but the blowback you're going to get from the medical growers and the patients and the caregivers is going to be um, good size. This is exactly the discussion that I would like to have and the governor's office would like us to have, but not yet. Um, so let's put, just put a hold those thoughts and we'll come back to them either at the end of the meeting or the next session. Oh, the last piece, I forgot, I'm sorry, the last piece from the governor's office is a request um, that there be a patient representative on one of our subcommittees. Um, uh, so just to and I appreciate that you are a patient representative, okay. Anthony. Um, but I think um, I think they, they felt like to be comfortably, you know, um, have uh, those voices comfortably represented felt uh, felt like a good thing to them. So if there's room on any of our subcommittees for another patient voice, um, and, and if we have uh, a we, I'd just like you all to consider that. Um, and it would be really nice to have one more. Okay. On our um, patient access subcommittee, we have three patients originally seated on the subcommittee, and we've added two more. Perfect. Okay. So that may satisfy that requirement. I think once we get the full rosters to the governor's um, office, they will see that that's represented, but I just wanted to make sure. Are you asking for a patient to be on each subcommittee? I'm not at all. No, I just wanted to make sure there was adequate um, somewhere in the subcommittees. It wasn't a good fit for mine, otherwise it would be there already. One of the things that I have, you know, as an independent person prior to this commission, I really kind of shied away from bringing a lot of patients into the legislature to go through all the hassle of getting there and getting home for two minutes of testimony or to sit through four, four to six hours at a me meeting like this. I never wanted to ask them to do that. Um, and so that's why I've picked people that are patients but are able to come and sit through four hours or, or get to the legislature and work 
with the legislature. So uh, that's why I picked uh, the patients that I did. Yeah, and, and for the training subcommittee, I didn't know if patients were necessarily a good fit for every single meeting either. Um, but I think it would be important, Anthony, for maybe some of the patients that sit on your committee to, to come into my committee as well. Um, and I think a lot of us need to sit on, in on each other's meetings and provide um, real-time feedback. Um, but I think it would be important to get the patient's perspective on, um, on the, the clinical experience with the physicians writing their authorization. So we can make that happen. Could we just, um, I guess for people who are calling in and those in the room who haven't been here before, could we just go around the room and uh, introduce ourselves so people know who's on the commission and who's here? Tom Jean, Deputy Health Officer from the Health Division. Jeff Coons, I'm the Deputy Chief of Police with the Kaiser Police Department and I'm the Law Enforcement Representative for the Commission. Katrina Hedberg, State Health Officer with the Public Health Division. Anthony Taylor, President of Compassion Oregon and uh, Patient Seat on the Commission. Dr. Rachel Knox, founder of American Cannabinoid Clinics and co-chair of the Oregon Cannabis Commission. Andre Russo, uh, Center Administrator for Health Protection, OHA, and OHA's representative on the commission. Jesse Sweet, agency representative for OLCC. Carol Yan, I'm the section manager for the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program, staff assistance. Shannon O'Fallon with the Oregon Department of Justice advising the Medical Marijuana Program and the commission. And okay, so let's go into the reports from each of the subcommittee. I just would like to hear. Um, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. And Pat is on phone. It's Pat. Sorry. Other introductions from callers? Um, I had just received, I'm to interrupt, I just received a note that said the number wasn't working. Could I get that again and text it over? Pat, are you on? I am on indeed. Can you introduce yourself? Sure. Pat Lutke, Senior Public Health Officer for Lane County and the Chief Medical Officer for our Community Health Center Clinic. Thank you. Okay, I think we're ready to dive into uh, Presentation from each of the subcommittee leads. Um, I would like to ask for a volunteer. Sure. Yes. <laughs> okay, Dr. Rachel Knox here, um, head of the training subcommittee, and this is training for medical professionals, particularly those writing authorizations for cannabis use in our state, but also other allied health professionals who may engage with patients and can help in the clinical management of patients um, on cannabis therapeutics. Um, so our first um, action item is to administer a survey to the current OMMP providers, assessing their understanding of the OMMP program, um, their preparedness to participate in the program, but also their clinical competency, so their clinical preparedness to engage with patients, not only at that first encounter, but in an ongoing fashion, as though they were managing a patient long-term on cannabis therapy. Um, and then we also want to identify the, the educational gaps, if you will, that are present currently, as well as assess the desire for, or, or what type of training program they might like to see in the future. Um, we have uh, reviewed what other states have required of their, their doctors authorizing um, for the use of cannabis, and, and some, some states don't have any requirements, like Oregon, we don't currently have requirements for training or continued education. Um, we, we strongly suggest that doctors who write authorizations get some continuing education credits on the subject matter, but we don't require it yet. Other states do and are aligned with some pre-existing continuing education programs um, that we, we felt weren't necessarily up to par with what we'd like to see for our providers in our state, and, and mostly because we really want to unify the language across not just the medical sector, but also the adult use sector, because we know that people, not just patients, but consumers, are going into dispensaries asking medical questions, even though they're not registered patients. 
So unifying and standardizing um, the professional and medical language that we use is preeminent, and then obviously clinical management moving forward for our patients is going to be very important, especially as research and the patient experience and training intersect. You know, moving forward, all these different areas are going to influence one, uh, one another and going to really improve our program um, as they do. Um, so with respect to the training program we'd like to see in Oregon, we are um, thinking about which route we want to take. We want to start with a pre-existing continuing education program, so at least we get some standardized training on board for uh, the, the physicians, um, so right now MDs and DOs who are writing authorizations in the state, or do we want to develop an original training program? Um, we like the idea of modular, modular training that clinicians can access online, that you can edit in real time um, as data and research um, it brings us more information, as well as holding seminars for our providers to come to in person and, and learn. Um, again, I have to stress from our program our belief that research is clinical data um, um, is, is going to make our training program better into the future and, and no state really has taken upon themselves to develop their own training programs from scratch. So I think we have a, a really good opportunity here in Oregon um, and with this commission and the deliverables um, to, to legislation to get something on the ground that we can work with. It's going to take some time to, to build. Um, I do have experience in building some training programs. It does take time. Um, but I think as, as, as long as we work hard to figure out the infrastructure that we'll need to get this done, I think we could come up with an or original training program for our providers in this state. Um, and then while we're focusing on healthcare providers, we do want to implement training for um, the adult use sector as well, so that the, the people in dispensaries, dispensary owners, cultivators, processors, everybody in between gets that standardized training so that when patients come to their doctors um, and they're, they're discussing with them what they talk to any of those other folks about, their doctor understands or when their doctor gives them information, they can go back to the dispensary, whether it's an adult use or medical dispensary or not, and everybody understand what that, what that customer, that consumer um, is wanting and needing. Um, and we, in our, in our meetings, have identified some of the subcategories that we feel um, need to be the, the core competencies um, but that's, that's rather lofty and it probably um, wouldn't even benefit uh, our, our recommendation to legislation at, at, at this point. So Dr. Nash, just a question for you. So do you feel like, I know you started out by saying that we needed a survey of OMFP providers um, and that we need to consider how we're going to administer the training program that is developed, whether it's their existing um, professional education um, frameworks or not. I guess my question is, for year one, do you think um, it's, um, more seek and find, you know, is it sort of survey more exploration before and spend a year knowing, um, trying to explore how exactly such a program would be implemented, or do you think there's like a year one legislative ask? I think year one uh, legislative recommendation as opposed to an ask because we have to put time into um, our own personnel needs. So how, how are, if we if we're going to develop our own original training, which I think everybody on the subcommittee feels would, would benefit um, our providers in this state it is going to be like a year, maybe, on, and even ongoing, um, in developing what we might think of a robust term heat program um, that could even be replicated in other states. So it is going to take some time. But I do think, and we'll have to discuss this, like how, how important is it for us to get a training on board? There are pre-existing programs that we have discussed um, in brief whether or not that is satisfactory, um, we'll have to, you know, and, and so that may be a legislative ask. I think we're, we're just teasing that apart. And we'll dissect that a little further at our next meeting. Because um, I don't want us to get into a circumstance where now we've aligned ourselves with a program, um, and, and a lot of these programs that do exist, they aren't up to date. What was one of the, the, um, the um, criticisms that we heard at our last meeting? Um, and so if we have no control over that content, is it something that we want to align ourselves up front? So maybe. I guess my answer to that is maybe. 
So um, thank you. Uh, just to kind of understand, uh, there are the medical providers, and that's the, this cannabis commission here is focused on medical patients. You also said something about uh, people who are working in retail dispensaries. So again, who's the target audience? And then I would ask Carol, I'm not up to date on what the statistics are, but we know the people who, um, and it has to be physicians, but who recommend um, uh, you know, use of cannabis, and they, if I'm not mistaken, fall into kind of categories. There's some who have quite a few patients, and that's been their focus, such as yourself, and then there's some who have a bunch of patients, you know, forget and then there's some who have one or two. And so, again, trying to figure out who the target audience is and what the purpose, but, but at least for the discussion here, I'm just trying to understand what the conversation was. So I get that more people need training, but it's sort of who and at what level and how do you sure or is it just that people ought to do this and therefore you develop something or that you're requiring it or anyway I'm just trying to figure out what yeah. the discussion was because no, that's more training is fine but the legislature is going to want okay how much money to whom and do we require it or not or I mean I'm just thinking yeah. other things like that right and, and we've talked about that and we'll have to get those numbers out but when we're talking about patient access we're not just talking about affordability and their existing a dispensary um, you know, access to quality care is important too. And when I have patients who have gone to another medical provider in the past and just wrote their authorization and didn't give them any clinical guidance in their cannabis therapies or told them wrong information and then they come to see me and I have to re-educate them, there's a problem. You know, we don't have um, the board specialty of endocannabinology just yet. It's coming. But how do we make sure that the patients that are, are engaging with clinicians and getting authorizations are getting the same information? And that's really important and, and, and really glare, glaring to me when I have patients coming into our clinic and telling us that the, the person behind the counter at the adult use dispensary was giving them medical advice. One, that's unlawful. Two, that's a liability for a dispensary. Um, so we are absolutely going to get into the language and the training of the people who are engaging with the patients at the dispensary level, adult use or otherwise, um, be, because they do need to be trained in what they can and cannot say or discuss with patients so that they're not held liable. We haven't seen anything happen yet, but the, the, the first instance where a person, a consumer complains that they got medical advice from a bud tender that harmed them, it's going to be a huge liability for that dispensary. Right? So how do we protect dispensary owners from, from that fallout? Well, we train. So we need to have unified, uniform training. And to the, to the extent that people get training, that can be variable. I do think that it would behoove all of us to have a minimum requirement. Um, and that's just doing our due diligence on behalf of the patient who is entrusting you know, their care to a provider. Um, and entrusting their care to the products that are being sold in, in dispensaries. Um, so I think we owe it to our consumers um, for some baseline, fundamental, foundational knowledge. Um, but endocannabinology is coming, so I do think there should be an opportunity for clinicians to get specialized you know, training as well. Um, who should administer that? I don't know. Um, but, but I do think it would be great to have a, a modular program that people can pick and choose, maybe some of the, the, the subspecialty areas in cannabis medicine that they could train in. Like if I'm an oncologist, maybe maybe the module on uh, on cancer and, and cannabis is something that I might be interested in. That might not be interesting um, to a primary care physician who's writing an authorization, or it might be. Um, but that's something else we're tackling: the minimum requirements and then um, any any specialized training that clinicians can seek after that. Does that answer your question, or sort of yeah, yeah. frame? Uh, Jesse Sweet, for the record, uh, if I may, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about the existing law on training, because at least when you're talking about the retail uh, employees at OLCC licensees, there's options here, and they don't necessarily have to be statutory. Um, as a condition of receiving a worker permit, OLCC had a, a broad mandate to uh, require training but we didn't know what to require. So we developed a test for permit applicants that was all based on compliance with laws and rules because there really wasn't anything out there. Um, so I, I agree with the, the sentiment that we really shouldn't be having these retail employees giving medical advice and, and that's a bad place to be. Um, but to the extent that we can make that module of the training discreet 
you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be in statute. It can come through administrative rules through the Liquor Commission. You get to do it. Section 6-2. Uh, Esther Chu, so are, are there existing training requirements for physicians who, um, uh, who, who authorize use of cannabis? So I, we can add, so on, yeah. on Trey and I, we had a, a subcommittee, when was that, about a year ago, uh, to look at basically um, what the recommendations uh, for physicians who were recommending. But anyway, it was guidelines. Um, but it did talk, just as uh, Dr. Knox said, about what would be a good idea, but it did not. There are no mandatory requirements. Now, the state of Oregon doesn't have many mandatory requirements for training. Um, it's, there's been a lot of discussion around pain, and I think we all, when we get uh, initially our license, is like five hours of pain training, and that's gone through the legislature a number of times about do we need to update that, and how many different, and all this kind of thing. But we rarely have specific requirements other than general CME or CNE or what you know whoever, um, and then the people sort of pick and choose which area of continuing education they would need. So this content specific, but again, it could be a recommendation to the legislature that if you are going to be one of the people who is recommending um, or authorizing uh, a card, that you then do have some at least yeah. minimal understanding, minimum or whatever, but of you know the endocannabinoid system, etc. You know, as physicians, we understand not wanting to be told what all these things we have to do and we have to pay for. We, I, I empathize 100 and 1,000%. Um, but the issue is we have to do our due diligence on behalf of the patients. And um, we really can no longer allow for misinformation um, to permeate. Um, the other thing is what, what is coming down the pipeline? Endocannabinology is coming. It will be a board certified, uh, accredited field of medicine. It is happening. Um, so are we going to sit around and wait for that to happen or, or not? I'm not a sit around and wait kind of person. Um, and so I think we can do a good job at, you know, at an administrative level or a legislative level. I think we can set precedent here. The other thing is medical malpractice is coming down the pipeline for clinicians who, um, who authorize for cannabis use. That will be a thing. Um, and so how are we protecting our, our clinicians? Um, and, and they absolutely are going to require some minimum training. So again, this is us getting ahead um, and getting, getting our, 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 our clinicians in our state prepared for what's coming down the pipeline. I'm, getting it, I'm guessing if we um, create resources to develop some of these online modular training um, resources that there's a hunger for it in the state. Um, but I, uh, the, so uh, I love the creation of it and making them available. Like I know that I and many of my colleagues would take it. I guess the question for me is, um, are we going to recommend that a specific group of people, those providing authorizations, have a minimum requirement within those resources we create? I think it's a fascinating idea. So that might be where we're headed. Right, any other comments for the education and training subcommittee before we move on? Any other comments? Yep, and Rachel, uh, Dr. Knox's report. All right, are we ready to move on? My next volunteer. Thank you, Jesse. <laughs> I, would, I would like to volunteer, Andre, to give the answer. He's the chair. I'll ask uh, Jesse for his assistance. So no problem. Uh, so we only met once. Uh, we didn't have a meeting in May. Um, we don't have any legislative recommendations at this time, although we do want to uh, look at the at data production, um, include that in the report, and have the legislature review that data so they can tailor any legislative concepts based on, on supply and demand. Um, administratively, we had two priorities. So our the recap or subcommittee is kind of divided into two sub subcommittees. Uh, one is product integrity in the sense of the product itself, so it was a theater product, and the other was uh, more of a, I guess, call it diversion issues, um, for lack of a better term. So our administrative recommendations out of those two parts of the subcommittee would be continue to evaluate the enrollment and use of CTS for the rest of the 
2018, and we we're coming up on some deadlines here. So July 1st, that anyone that meets the criteria for tracking and CTS will have to be using the, the system by then. And if you're not, you still have to use the OMOS system. So to follow and evaluate uh, implementation of CTS, uh, so that would probably take the remainder of the year to provide some recommendations legislatively. Uh, second would be to develop an, a random or audit testing regime for products. So that would be the involvement of OLCC, ODA, and OHA there. And OHA's involvement would be uh, ORLAP. And within that would be to develop some sort of reference, what we call the reference laboratory, that could uh, serve as an arbiter of test results done by private testing laboratories. Anything else? Yeah, Mr. Sweet. I'll, I'll add a little bit on the request for data. Um, we essentially are trying to find out two things. First, um, what is the total production potential of the OMMP system? Um, how many plants are growers currently authorized to grow in the state of Oregon? Um, there's been a lot of discussion about overproduction and overproduction um, fueling uh, interstate traffic, illegal interstate traffic. So we would like to get the best number that we can out of OMMP, provide that number to the legislature um, so that they can make um, informed decisions about uh, the legislation that they're considering. The second data point that we're looking for is designed to test how well the tracking in Tech 57 is actually working. Um, so what we've asked staff for there is a list of the total number of growers who at grow sites who are subject to CTS tracking under the legislation. And then after July 1st, an actual of how many of those who are subject to the requirement have actually signed up to meet the requirement. Uh, those are the two initial things. And then once we get tracking going later in the calendar year, we'll be able to report actual numbers out of the metric system. Um, but I think it's important to get that, that first point of participation rate before we provide any numbers because uh, the numbers are just going to be a, a snapshot based on the participation rate. So I have a note to add. So on the first data point, it would be an estimate based upon max permitted within the medical system. So that would be an assumption of everybody is growing six, six plus whatever poundage they have per, they're allowed per plant. Correct. So that was the request. If, if every person authorized to grow medical marijuana in the state of Oregon was growing their maximum number of plants, how many plants is that? It's about 10 million. We're done. Actually, this is Anthony. I ran those numbers a couple of months ago, and um, it's hard to use those numbers because I think um, when we get that right down to grow site administrators, the OHA has projected that there's about 2,000 grow sites that need to be uh, registered with grow site administrator to go into OLCC, and I don't think we're going to get close to that number. And um, those 2,000 grow sites serve about 15,000 patients. And so we really, really, really need to figure out how to get these people into the program um, to save patients, basically. Um, <clears throat> I know turnout has been low so far at most of the meetings that OHA and OLCC are having. I'm doing everything I can to make those numbers go up, but <clears throat> it really is, it really exemplifies um, the financial strain and struggle that the growers are having to go through to provide cannabis for their patients, and it is critical mass in my opinion. I don't know how much lower we can go in patient numbers and still support the plan, still support the program that's based on fees. We're, I think we're dangerously close to that when we get a chance and Carol gets to walk us through the numbers. But I think we're in crisis mode and we really need to figure out what we're going to do here in the next couple of months to make sure our program maintains its integrity and its uh, part level of participation above, above what's needed to fund the program. I 
just had the same question for you that I had for Rachel is, um, does it seem like we need a year of data collection um, and fact finding, or are any pieces of this um, going to be a legislative recommendation for this year? For example, um, you know, public reference library development of random audit testing, any of those pieces feel like they're right for this year? So I'll, I'll speak to some of the data and I'll defer to Andre on the, on the reference testing. I think uh, some of the data that we've requested is absolutely going to be ready for the legislature. You know, the maximum number of plants that can be grown in the system, we can take a snapshot and provide that as a moment in time. Uh, and the same for uh, CTS participa participation. Um, we can absolutely provide that as a snapshot. Um, and I think those are the important numbers that the legislature hasn't necessarily had before. Um, but there's other data that I think will benefit from, from a longer time period. Um, you know, a year from now, we'll have better data than we have three months from now. Um, but I don't know that that prevents us from, from making any uh, recommendations to the legislature for this upcoming session to the extent that those recommendations are just that they consider the, uh, the present data in right-sizing uh, OMMP and, and considering future governance. I have a clarifying question. Is the overproduction problem in our state related to medical growers or legal adult use licensed growers? Yes. <laughs> um, there's overproduction in both systems, um, but I think what we're struggling right now is trying to quantify um, where the overproduction and where the export activity is concentrated. We essentially have three markets for marijuana and cannabis in Oregon. We have OLCC, OMMP, and illegal. So. Um, I think there's overproduction in all three markets, and uh, we're going to be struggling with trying to quantify that um, as we go forward to make better recommendations. Okay, so when it, with respect to OLCC cultivators and overproduction, um, and I was on, you know, in the meeting about the canopy bump up and all that stuff, which sort of doesn't make sense to me when we have an overproduction problem. Um, so are there any recommendations to, the, you know, legislatively or to the OLCC with how to manage the overproduction within that system that could easily go to patients? So OLCC will be working on a comprehensive report on production in our regulated system, and that will be delivered uh, towards the end of this calendar year. Uh, as far as recommendations, um, you know, I, I think really we have a wide open playing field as far as recommendations on how OLCC licensees could interact with patients and how they could subsidize the needs of patients. Uh, right now, uh, there are ways for people to do it lawfully if they choose to do it lawfully, um, but we don't really have, except for the bump up canopy, um, which has been really not used um, effectively, we don't have any incentives written into the law um, to to incentivize uh, redirecting surpluses to patients. Where are the surpluses going now? Same place they're going on the medical system. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I, yes, that was a rhetorical question. Um, I think there there probably are easy solutions, and I don't. I never thought the bump of canopy was an appropriate solution. You know why? Why? Why have licensees buy into? more overproduction and then get to sell just a small port. None of that made sense to me when we already have overproduction as a problem. So let's try to capture that and reroute it to patients yeah, lawfully. And, I mean, I, I don't disagree with you. I've, I've spoken with some people in the industry um, who are doing this charitably. Um, there's mechanisms for doing it charitably. Um, I don't think that there has been, based on just my anecdotal observations, I don't think there's been too much of that type of activity happening. I think there could, do, could be more, and uh, you know, potentially the state could, could find a way to incentivize that activity. Uh, Anthony here, uh, to incentivize it, one thing that came out of our subcommittee was making um, a certain level of donation a requirement to get your medical endorsement through OLCC. 
And then the other thing I just want to touch on, there's 45,000 patients in this state. Um, that means that the maximum they can produce is 270,000 plants. The formula that OLCC used to convert plants to canopy was a 40 square foot per plant. If you figure that out, that's about 10 million square feet divided by an acre shows that the patients are growing about 270 acres of cannabis in this state. So that's about what's licensed right now. So if the retail producers are producing a million pounds, the medical growers are going to be close. The medical growers will be close to that number. Um, and since the state has basically shut off their market until they can get into OLCC metric system and try to, tra try to transfer up to 20 pounds, um, and there's just a lot of product out there that we've got to figure out how to make work for patients. Thank you. Uh, one other data point I'd like to add to this discussion, um, which is not directly related to Anthony's statement, is that the sales at retail in the OLCC license system right now are uh, about 12 to 15 percent to cardholders. Um, so that's another thing to consider when we're talking about the way that the systems interact. Uh, the, the medicals, some medical cardholders are already being served um, through OLCC and that's demonstrated by the data in the metric system. Um, two other points. Uh, one is that the numbers I saw from OLCC show about 40 million in sales per month to consumers and about 5 to 7.5 for patients. So that's a breakdown. And then I had a comment on yours, but I lost it. So I yield. So the second half of that for the random testing audit. So we have currently have enough statutory authority that we don't need to make some recommendations as far as the authority to implement such a program. What we would be going to the legislature for would be asking for position authority and then a funding source to get the, to operationalize the random uh, audit testing program. It probably wouldn't be a large ask, um, if that, and that's by the extent of what we would ask for or recommend. Okay. Is your subcommittee going to go into detail on on what should be standard? testing that's already in the rules okay or to make recommendations to that and the reason I ask that from the perspective of a clinician is because there are things that I want to see on labeling that don't already exist especially when I'm talking about um, um, medicine right um, cannabinoid profiles are one thing but terpenes are a whole other thing um, that that can really make or break an experience with a patient on any given product or strain um, and we don't currently report on the other molecules that are in the in cannabis, but it's going to be increasingly relevant um, as clinicians are becoming you know, smarter, um, as the, the research becomes more robust. And when we're talking to patients about the chemical constituents of their, of their products, that terpene profile is going to become more, even more important than the cannabinoid profiles. Um, and so we would like to see stuff like that on the label. And so I don't know what route we would have to take to encourage that additional testing, but it would be more meaningful clinically for patients and consumers. So, so right now, testing is for public safety purposes. Um, you know, the, yeah, so we're setting a we're, to go beyond that. Yeah, we're setting a floor as far as the minimum standards on what a label should be, and now OLCC has authority over labeling and I think that their general position is to keep the label uncluttered and, and as readable as possible. So I would agree that eventually at some point, probably particularly for medical grade labeled uh, items that you would want, like a, a larger profile. Um, but I, I don't think the time is right until we have better, I guess, research to inform what an appropriate label would look that. like. Well, we have that with respect to chemical constituents. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not going to, I don't plan on adjusting the labels beyond what LOLCC is amending the labeling rules right now uh, as far as this company's work in the first year. Um, the priority would be to, to have a system where the state can 
audit or randomly test product that's either at the wholesale level or on the shelf to ensure that the, the product is, is safe and then maybe in the future go into the clinical integrity of a product or the information that would be useful for, for clinical purposes. I appreciate that. I'm going to push sure. for it to happen more expediently, but thank you. I think that's something we should keep on the table. You know, I think we probably won't get to it first year, but I can imagine a subcommittee that is clinical integrity, not just you know, <laughs> consumer integrity. Um, then we can play the sticker game next year and see if that rises to the surface. Um, so I think it's a natural move on to Anthony's subcommittee. I'm oh, sorry. Okay, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, I'm sorry, I think Katrina had one. Sorry, I had one comment. A quick comment to this point and uh, the previous point. Uh, but it does strike me, uh, similar to the comment I had made earlier, is kind of who is the audience? So um, when Rachel was talking about the training that needs to happen, certainly there's what needs to happen for the physicians and the patients. So this idea of what are the constituents, what are the different chemicals, how might they react, that I'm not sure belongs on a label. Certainly when you drop by other medications in the store, it's not all on the label. There's a package insert, here's this, here's that. And the question again is, is that training for the uh, person who's recommending? Probably not. It's probably more the information to uh, the consumer who might be buying products. So again, it seems like it actually fits a fair amount uh, within the work that your committee is doing. I know that part of the issue we have um, when we're talking about the testing really is how many labs in the state are able to test and what do they test for and how much product, what do they need to sample and how homogeneous is the product. And in other words, there's a whole lot of things that need to happen in order to come up with a package insert, for lack of a better word. And so, you know, one of the things, and we've talked about this all along in all of our committees, one of the giant limitations when it comes to this is at the federal level, it's a Schedule One substance. And so you cannot do the type of research that has been done for other, um, you know, medications that are on the market. Um, and so given that, and what are the boundaries? You don't want to have a requirement about all the labeling, and you don't have any laboratories that are able to be, you weren't saying this, but you know, you don't have the laboratories that are able to test for it. So. Um, at that, so that was one point. The second point that I wanted to bring up is a little bit what Andre said, that I think in this report to the legislature, we do need to be clear about kind of what, what the ask is, for lack of a better word. Is it something we need statute, or do we actually have statutory rule authority? Are there things we can do with policy with the little p, and what we really need are some resources, or we need uh, you know, some, some support behind uh, what we're doing. So I think as we go through, we should be really clear the ask is, you know, we have a lot of information we haven't been able to implement if you don't have resources. There are areas that are kind of a black box, and not only do we not have the resources, we don't have the information. But just going through, we want to be sure that we're not asking for something we can already do. Um, so that might be kind of background. Given that we're able to do X, Y, Z, what our limitation is or the barrier, and I think we talked about that at meeting number one. Um, when we're talking about sort of the, the role of this commission in responding to specifically the legislature, what uh, what's the current status of what are the barriers that's preventing us from doing research, you know, more product for patients, more labeling, more testing, or whatever, and to be really clear whether it's, forgive me, just money, because <laughs> just money is a lot more than that, or is it resources, or is it ability, or is it the science behind it, or, you know, what are the barriers and how can we potentially address them? Yeah, and, and with respect to what's clinically relevant on, on that, that product label um, or not, that is important because when, when providers are talking to their patients about the, the parts of the, the cannabis plant that will benefit their medical problem, they want to be able to go to the shop at the retail outlet and get a product that fits that description. Um, right now that doesn't exist and it's actually really simple to turn it on. Um, but maybe it's just a market differentiator. You know, maybe I'm speaking to the people watching right now who are processors or, and or do packaging. Because there is a precedent. You know, in the state of Washington, there's great companies that label every, absolutely every single terpene that's in their product. And that's a, that's a differentiator. They're going to make money because people are going to be able to go to that retail shop, get that product, and, and it's going to say exactly what the doctor said. Um, so maybe that's not something that we have to spend a lot of time on, but somebody needs to hear me today when I say that because it's going to make you uh, a better business person. And there are growers and retailers in Oregon who do this um, voluntarily as well. Yep, that's a differentiator. They're the ones who are going to stick around. You know, the other thing is that the more testing is more cost uh, to patients because their growers or their wholesalers or whoever is going to have to 
step up and pay for that testing, so we have to keep an eye on that with respect to one of our guidelines is make sure it's still affordable. The other thing is, um, uh, in response to what Katrina said about the research, yeah, there's a lot of barriers in this country about research, but there's a lot of research being done in other countries that we can look to because it has just been almost non-existent for patients, for cannabis research to be done, and certainly for human, certainly for human trials and all that. So we have to look outside the United States for a lot of the research that we're going to Yeah, and I'll just um, point out that, I mean, our goal for the next time this sub this full commission meets will be in July, and I think, um, you know, September is coming fast, so the goal for July will be to really filter out what is the ask, you know, um, so to sort of distinguish sort of what we need to have and what we already have um, authority to do, um, and then the, the parts that need to be um, to lead to a legislative change and the associated budget with that. So. Um, Anyway, that's what we're pushing towards. I think we're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. All right, so Anthony, I'll move to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, patient Access Subcommittee is a two-part committee. We're supposed to look at patient access, and we're also supposed to look at streamlining, restructuring, and expanding the program. Uh, so what this subcommittee has begun doing in its second meeting is focusing on the patient aspect, access aspect of our duties. <clears throat> um, so we're going to focus on the patient access, of course, and um, we started off our last subcommittee meeting by talking about patient surveys, target date for the completion uh, to be year's end, which method should we use for the survey, and uh, if it should be for existing patients or patients that have left, and also how can it integrate with other subcommittees and their questions. Um, uh, the general consensus was that it would sh be, it would, should focus on people that have left the program, but consideration uh, be given uh, to the ability to contact those people. That could be an issue. Uh, and then, of course, method for conducting the survey is still being discussed as it relates to cost and ability to maintain as primary considerations. Um, Andre uh, gave us some feedback on the cost of doing mailings and uh, things of that nature, so we're going to still keep that on the table for consideration. Uh, then we moved into patient access conversation about after that. Um, we discussed various approaches to who would qualify for reduced cost and or free medicines and how to get those medicines and those that needed. Uh, there are several subsets of patients, including those that already receive a reduced fee for the patient card. Kind of along with that is those that are paying their full fee. Also, those OMNP patients that are still that are in the Oregon Health Plan and how that may uh, work. Um, creating uh, the, another subset is those that need medical grade products with no interest in growing, processing, or selling. And finally, those unable to meet financial costs of being in a program slash falling through the cracks. Um, other things we considered were uh, growers' ability to give away to any patient. And I'm going to digress back to our conversation a little bit before because Rachel was asking about this bump up and all that. That really came out of efforts by the OLCC and patient advocates to create a legislation that would allow OM and OLCC producers to just give directly to patients. That was, what, two and a half years ago? We tried to get that and we ended up with a bump up canopy. So um, there's other things to consider rather than adding the canopy, but uh, designating part of your existing canopy and a number of things. But most of the medical growers or uh, OLCC producers aren't participating because it's more work for not much return. Um, we also talked about for patient access, expanding the list of those can that can sign the APS, talking about naturopaths and nurse practitioners. Also, we had a brief discussion about the nonprofit dispensaries, but more in light of the way um, patients were um, evaluated to determine if they could get access to a reduced program. Um, and the nonprofit dispensaries had um, a way that uh, patients could be at or 
below the national poverty line, but that designation uh, was to be determined by the dispensary, which, um, as Hunter pointed out, not much of a path forward. And then how do I incentivize the OLCC retail outlets to participate? And finally, the ability of the state to subsidize um, the costs. And then I also provided uh, the commission with a um, number of survey questions that could be asked. Quite a few survey questions, mostly so everybody can see kind of where we're coming from and what other questions could be asked, added to this survey to expand it. Um, I'm not sure that, you know, we're talking about having this done by year's end, so I'm not sure how much of that data will be available for our um, legislative concept proposals for the report back to the legislature. Um, but that's kind of our target date. So the first meeting, I would add that um, Dr. Chu sat in and uh, she tried to put it all into context, which is if you had three million dollars, how would you make this work? So we're kind of using that as our background on, on how to proceed. We do want to keep in mind policy versus legislation, what can be done administratively rather than going to the legislature, and in keeping those asks reasonable. I don't want to get bound up in, in asking for stuff that just out of our reach, at, at least at this time. So um, that's about all I had uh, for my report, although there is part of um, our subcommittee looking at what's going on legislatively, and the OHA is currently uh, working on their draft road rules to implement Senate Bill 1544, and one thing that um, the commission, I think, should be keeping an eye on is what they're going to propose, because right now there's a roadblock in our three to one ratio uh, for immatures. That's a big stumbling block right now, is the ratio of immatures under 24 inches to um, be able to better serve uh, the, the growers for these patients. We have not seen a final draft. I'm not sure when it's going to be available, um, but we should take a look at it to make sure that these immatures under 24 ounce inches come out in favor of the growers rather than the agency. Anthony, you made mention before, I think, in comment to either Jesse or Andre about the number of patients um, at present and looking, you know, projecting into the future and not being able to sustain the medical program through patient fees. Um, have you guys discussed outreach? Um, to the general population here in Oregon. Um, I, for one, know that I, I continue to see patients who are becoming patients for the first time. So I know there's still a lot of people out there who are considering um, jumping into the program. And, uh, you know, I, I suspect that a lot of people just don't know their options or um, their, their why and maybe even incentives to get them into the program. Um, yeah, I do uh, hear that also from other clinics that new patients are continuing to come in. Um, I'm not sure how many we'll see in the next quarter, if we're going to lose or gain, uh, but we really are, I think, at a critical point uh, in this program where we've got to take some action pretty, pretty quickly to keep it from caving in on itself. We'll know more after we get the budget presentation, but I'm, I'm, I'm a little worried. I'm a lot worried, actually. You. So, so my recommendation is to talk about outreach in your subcommittee. Yes, um, I'm sorry, I didn't yeah. really answer your question. We have talked about it. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to go about it because the OHA has, over the years, not advocated for either the program or its patients. So I'm not quite sure the path forward, but we are discussing it. So if I may. Um, on the outreach question, I think there's some strategies that any organization can employ when they want to get some information from its participants. One would be focus group. Here, I would think that a comprehensive survey of our existing patients would provide us a lot of answers that we're, we're asking. Um, I think that's probably the best route that we have available to us now. Um, in, in 
in developing a survey because I sit here in public health and my background and, and not all the professionals I work with, I would want a survey to be as objective, scientific as possible and generalizable to the population that we're asking the questions of. Um, so administration of a survey is not an easy task, but I think that we have the tools here to do it. Um, and then I think this commission can evaluate questions that they want the survey to ask. And, and I'm looking at Krachina here, but I think that there's a way that we could utilize the resources here in public health to develop the survey and, and help administer it. Um, of course, cost is always an issue, but, but I think we have the resources and tools here to, to develop a survey that's going to be comprehensive, objective, and, and answer a lot of our questions. Uh, which is great, um, but by outreach more specifically, I mean marketing, you know, getting, getting new patients into the program. It's just not a function of this government agency um, to market and to, to in, you know, to provide some sort of incentive for patients to join a program. It's like we don't, does the Department of Motor Vehicles, you know, want more people to get driver's licenses? No. I mean, that's the same function, right? It's, it's an agency that administers a registration program and regulates the, the aspects of that program. It's not a business. It's not like Business Oregon, which has a different mission. So, you know, if you're an outside uh, person or organization, you can sit there, like Compassionate Oregon, you can sit there and advocate that you need more patients to join, that it's in their best interest to use cannabis for therapeutic purposes. That's fine, but the state agency, that's not their function, and we just can't do that. That is fine, but to, to be clear, we're, we're trying to develop a, a, a program for patients. Um, that means making this program better for existing patients, and yes, getting more patients into the program because we have research incentives now. Um, we want to glean information, and not only that, we want to provide good medical care to patients. It's like, I worked in hospitals, right? There's an incentive to get patients into the doors, which is crazy because a hospital's where you treat sick people, right? So why do we want to market to sick people, get more sick, we want people to get well. Pharmaceutical companies are another, you know, they're constantly marketing to people, to the consumer about their products. I'm not saying that's what we do, but I think we need to think about outreach. If funding the OMMP is, is in crisis, well then we have to come up with solutions and outreach is one of those solutions. If we need to collect more fees, well that means we need more people entering into the program. So I think that is something that we have to think about even if it makes some people uncomfortable or even if it's sort of outside the scope of our, our, our commission, it needs to be talked about. And I don't think there's any problem in soliciting patients into a program they're gonna benefit from medically. Again, we're talking about cannabis as medicine, which means we're helping people address their medical needs, health, healing, and wellness. That is our ultimate outcome here, even though we're talking about training and research and diversion and all that. The person at the end of this program is the consumer. And that consumer, in, our, in, in this case, is a patient looking for an alternative to conventional medical therapies that isn't working. So at every single meeting, if we do not place this patient first, I'm going to bring it up because right now we're talking about patient's access to medicine that does help. And we have the research that exists worldwide that supports that. So that has to be our preeminent focus. So if we have to come up with some way to help get more patients into this medical marijuana program, let's do it. I, I, see, I'm gonna disagree. And I'm, on a personal level, I'm not gonna disagree and I'm not gonna put my opinion on the therapeutic benefits of cannabis into this conversation. As a representative of this agency, I'm gonna thoroughly disagree with you is that this agency isn't here to promote patients joining the program. People talk your about, agency. Pe pe yes, that's right. Okay. And, that, and that's the agency that's administering this program. So, and people want to talk about, we don't have enough patients and we need more patients. We don't know that. We really don't. We don't know if 100,000 medical marijuana patients in the state of Oregon is the right number. We don't know if 45,000 patients is the right number. And I'm going to propose that whatever the number is, is the right number. Because the reason that the patient is in this program is because they had a discussion with their clinician on the benefits for cannabis for a particular therapeutic purpose. And the clinician said, hey, I think you should try this out and I'm gonna sign this form for you because you brought it to me and you wanna be part of this program. That's, I mean, that's why we have patients. 
it, it's a choice that people are making to use cannabis and then they're having a private discussion with their physician on the use of cannabis. It's completely different than signing up for OHP or Social Security or something like that. I mean, so I, when I hear that we don't have enough patients, we don't know that. It, 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 we don't know. And we don't know until we start collecting data. And it's just, it's very frustrating to know that we need more patients. Well, I, I, you know. I don't think anybody said that, that we need more patients. It was, it's exactly it was an, it's been it's been an said event. for the past, since I've been okay, here. Okay, so let's just pragmatically, right, if, if OMMP runs off of fees and the patient numbers are dwindling, well then there's not enough, they may eventually not be enough money. I don't know the current state, again, we have to collect data, but that every patient has a clinician who's willing to talk about cannabis with them is highly inaccurate. If we are going to sit here and just accept, you know, that patients enter the program because they had a meaningful conversation with their well-intending clinician, that doesn't exist. We still we still live in a society where clinicians are are staunchly opposed to their patients using cannabis, despite the literature out there, despite it. Then that's okay. It, it's okay in the sense that this agency isn't trying to change that on a policy level. And, and Rachel, you know, personally, you and I are probably not too far off in the way that we believe things and in our opinions. But that's not, no, I, that's not why I'm sitting here at this desk. It's not for my personal reasons or personal opinions. And I, I just don't think that we're seeing, like, we have this cognitive dis disconnect on what the purpose of this program is for. And I just don't think that, I don't really want to engage in that conversation right now. But, but, but yes. I think, well, it's going to be a lot longer. We're going to consume people's time. That, that's not fair to everybody else. But I, I just, and I would like to sit down with you like on a private level and we can have that discussion about what the purpose of a government agency is and the purpose of a private organization that does advocacy work. No, I'm not, I'm not. Because there are a lot of private not-for-profit organizations that have the ability to advocate and to promote and to market, but this agency doesn't have that advantage. Yes, yeah, so so OH, yes, I understand you're the, the administration body, but this is, these are still conversations that we can have and Anthony's subcommittee can discuss, right? Discussing outreach and how do we do that pragmatically within the constructs of these agencies, what they can and cannot promote publicly. We need to start having those conversations. I don't have the answers. But I would just like to recommend that outreach be something that is discussed. Um, we want this program to be great for as many people who want to enter into it as, as possible. Um, we don't want to limit the number of people who enter into the program. We also don't want, you know, we, we want to be able to control it and, and, and allow it to grow and scale. We want all of those things, but a part of wanting to grow and scale is getting people into the program for the first time. Um, and so how do, we, maybe the conversation is how do we create a program that we don't have to solicit, right? We don't have to advertise for, that is compelling enough on itself to bring patients in. Maybe that's what we're talking about, right? But we just didn't. Uh, I, I would think, I would agree with the first part of that. Um, we want a self-sustaining program that is gonna provide the benefits of being a medical marijuana patient or card holder, and we want that to, to flourish. But every time someone says, we don't have enough patients and we need more patients, based on what? You know, it's just like, what? I'm just, gonna, I'm just worried we're getting into a little bit of a loop there, yes. and I would love Katrina's thoughts, because I know she's been able, she's been chopping a bit, and then I have a wrap up. Yeah, so I, I think, obviously, I also work for this agency, but I do think it's really clear, and it's true for a lot of the work now I'm getting, uh, you know, 10,000 foot level about roles and responsibilities of different organizations and agencies. So I'm a physician, but I'm not a clinician. So my expertise has gone into epidemiology and public health and those kinds of things. So again, that's I'm every bit as much a physician as other people. I just don't have expertise in one area. I have it in another. So being really clear about the role of government, a regulation, again, we're a government health authority, we've got um, police here, part of government, we've also got OLCC here, part of government, different than advocacy, different than patient, different than clinicians, um, you all are clinicians and obviously expertise, so I think we need to be really careful, and the things that are written, so I, I always go, so what is the statutory um, framework for this commission? 
and I don't didn't see anywhere that it said marketing, you know, uh, cannabis as a safer alternative to let's just say opioids, right? And that lots of people have proposed that, and, and there might be some data that for certain conditions, yes or not. But again, that's not our purpose. Our purpose is to make sure people get information that however the regulation is, it's done within a framework. It's as a framework for the program, what research is needed, et cetera. So I would just bring us back on down to specifically what it is. And again, I'm not disputing that certain people and or um, organizations might feel strongly about there needs to be more, there might be others that need to be less, et cetera. I don't think the purpose of this commission is to decide that one way or the other. It's to really focus on exactly what the um, what the legislature said, what the barriers are, how we might address those, what the legislature, what we could do with policy, and not get in, not get into this discussion about are there enough patients or not. Again, I, I, I didn't hear you say that well, exactly. But last time we were here we had public comment that there's you know that's not overproduction, it's under, you know, there's not too much demand. <laughs> there are too much supply, there's too little demand. And again, these are all opinions that might be valid. The purpose of this commission is not to decide yay or nay with that. It's to really be very concrete and address exactly what, what's in the statute. I 100% agree with that, but to get to those answers, we have to have these sorts of conversations. We have to talk about some of the nuances of what is happening and, and, and where we want to see this program go. It, it, we need to get down to the bare bones of it to then rebuild what we want this to look for. Um, look to look like moving forward, right? To get, the reason I said the word marketing wasn't because I think you should market. I just wanted you all to have a very clear understanding in layman's terms what I was talking about by outreach because when I mentioned outreach, Andre responded with, we're gonna survey the existing patients. So I knew there was a disconnect there. So I, I don't have a problem having sort of these more heated conversations because we, I need to know who each one of you are and you need to know who I am. And we need to understand the why, our why is for being here. And yes, that's going to turn into exactly what they're asking for us. But in order to get there, do you see what I'm saying? In order to get there, we sort of have to have these more nuanced conversations. Right, and my so proposal is if, if you want to figure out what the patients want, let's ask them. Yeah. And the mechanism to ask them is through the survey. And so if you have other outreach strategies, like a focus group, then I mean, I'm all ears. So just one other comment on that, that um, certainly I know that this is uh, related to the medical marijuana program and medical cannabis. It would be possible to have a survey uh, of people at the point of dispensary because we know that there are a number of people who purchase retail marijuana for medicinal purposes. So you could actually ask them, even if they're not cardholders, we could do at the point of exit or whatever, survey and say, so did you buy this? Are you buying it for? Yeah. You know, what's the purpose, et cetera. So there might be a way to capture that, but I would be reluctant to do kind of a broad outreach or marketing. Are you aware that if you're in chronic pain, you know, cannabis might be a, you know, a good answer or any, uh, again, you weren't saying that, but, but I'm reluctant. You did mention the general population. I'm not sure about that, but there are enough dispensers, enough people buying retail and have certainly heard about it that um, seeing how many of those folks are purchasing retail for medicinal purposes might, might be another um, population that we would uh, be interested in capturing in a survey, not just the cardholders. Yeah, I think what I'm hearing from you actually, I think there's like a, a little bit of a difference in the language. Um, I think, you know, when we're talking about state agencies and it's the same in academia, you say marketing and instantly like, um, yeah. you know, the pH level in your stomach just drops. But um, I think um, I think what we're talking about, what I'm hearing from you is more, it's more an access issue. Like um, how do people utilize something if they're not aware of it? Um, and uh, and also uh, awareness also tends to fall um, uh, along sort of, um, it, t it tends to in itself create disparities. And that's what Anthony's subcommittee is all about, is sort of like leveling some of these disparities um, because access tends to always go to people with more privilege and more information. So um, how, do you, how do you even that out unless you do some form of public awareness? Um, but we just gotta keep that in parameters and feel comfortable with, you know, with the, um, the agencies we're working with and the, um, and the purpose of this commission. So I think there's there's a more common ground than not, but uh, but you know we'll engage in some of these little things out around the margins where we tend to divide a little bit. But uh, Anthony, I know you also. Yeah, I just had a quick comment. The agencies can't promote, but this commission sure can. All we need is the consent of the governor to do that, and it is part of our responsibility to do outreach. And we are going to keep talking about it. 
in our subcommittee and, um, you know, is there a magic number of how many people in the state need to be part of our program? No, there's not a magic number, but the Oregon Pain Management Commission says one out of five people in this state suffer from some sort of, some sort of chronic pain. So there is a pretty big number out there of Oregonians that can be in this program, and they need to be made aware of it. And that's part of our responsibility for patient access, is to make this awareness available to all these people. I have, I know a lot of people that purchase cannabis over the counter for medical use, and they do it anonymously in, in these dispensaries, and I would say that I'm not going to pick any numbers, but there's a certain percentage of all those people that are coming in and buying as a consumer that are actually patients that uh, purchase their cannabis to mitigate their symptoms uh, anonymously, and uh, we have to figure out how to get those people into our medical program so that they can take advantage, so they have a card that they can take advantage of discounted prices and um, uh, the uh, medical grade products. I just have one little question um, about all these surveys, so the surveys of the OMMP providers and patients. So it sounds like we have the capability to develop the surveys. Is it the deployment of the surveys that costs money? So is it the mailings and the, or do we have capacity? Like, I guess what is that, are there any barriers that require um, a budget request or something? Well, we don't have the funding for it, but we have a program within public health that that can administer the surveys. So, yeah, I, I think to answer that question, we have technical expertise. Yeah. We know how to do it. We can do sampling, private, et cetera. But, and actually to spend the time to put it together, to figure out how to capture patients, how to implement, how to collect the data, how to analyze it, how to synthesize, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, and make sure that it's accurate and, and those kinds of things. So we have technical expertise. I mean, I know how to do this, or you know how to do this, but you know, it, it, that's other duties as a sign. We're not actually going to do a robust process without more resources, which is back to my initial point. Is what, what is the barrier? Is the barrier knowledge? Is the barrier the resources? Is the barrier of the what, What's the question? Okay. Jeff. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to digress, but I want to, I have two questions. I want to ask Anthony one, just from my knowledge, back to this document that we received, that there's a discrepancy between the ratio. And in your comments here, you said there, this was unworkable for most growers. OHA might propose a three to one ratio and, and others are wanting a 15 to one. Can you, just from my knowledge, tell me what the problem is there? And then I'm gonna have a question on process for Shannon. Well, the problem is, <coughs> excuse me, the problem is that a three to one ratio, meaning you have three immature plants under 24 inches for every mature you have, it's just not gonna work for a number of growers out there. It does not give them a large enough selection pool, large enough pool to make an accurate selection for some of these more uh, finicky strains. The work group um, came up with a number a lot bigger than three to one and um, I think we need to take that into consideration and um, I think we need to err on the side of the growers rather than the agency. Thank you. So, so if I'm understanding this at a certain point an immature plant does not turn into a mature plant because they're going to be that's only correct. so many can move forward. That's correct. And OLCC has unlimited number of plants below 24 inches as long as they don't exceed their, their immature canopy limit. And there's a lot of issues around this, but we've been having the same discussion for three years and it really is time that it really kind of, as Giuliani would say, come to an end. Okay, thank you. And a process question just for you, Shannon. I want to be clear on what, what our, our role and responsibility is as a commission. In the end of his letter, he says the commission should consider discussing overriding OHAs, um, whatever they recommend. And I'm wondering if that's, are, are we like the OLCC where rules are brought to us and we vote on rules, or are we just advisory and we're supposed to stick with the mandate that's, that's laid out in 2198? Yeah, Shannon O'Fallon. Um, the Cannabis Commission is, is advisory, so it would not have the authority to sort of o overrule OHA's decision on rules. And I guess the other thing that I that I just want to say that Anthony and I have a bit of a disagreement about whether or not there was 
consensus in this legislative work group, I would say that there, there was not. So I just, just want to put that out there. I was just working from the meeting minutes. And you can dispute the meeting minutes if you like, but that's what we go by in research and, and doing papers and stuff. That's what the minutes reflect. You know, that's what they reflect. So, uh, I think we're digressing a, a little bit on this point. Um, both Anthony and I were on a rules advisory committee for this OMMP rulemaking. Um, you know, as Shannon mentioned, uh, this commission here exists to advise the agencies. Um, and as somebody who has advised the agency for the last eight years, I can tell you they don't always listen to your advice. Um, I, I think if this commission wants to take a, a position on this particular issue, the thing to do would be to take that position um, during the public comment period for the rulemaking so that it can be considered by OMP on the record. I would concur, concur with that absolutely. We need to, during the comment period, make a recommendation. That would require consensus here, I guess. What is the deadline for making a comment there? Does it's not out yet. So okay. we will be putting out the, the draft um, June 1st, and then we'll, that'll be posted to our website. I can send you a link when it Great. is uh, posted to the website, and public comment is open for a specific period of time. So I'll send that out to everyone, and you can make a comment if you uh, come up with that as a consensus decision. So is that something that, yeah. So just briefly, and I'm looking to our lawyer, and maybe I'm there are a number of us who work for state agencies. So if a commission comes up with a recommendation, it probably is these members of the commission, because I think a number of us that work for the different agencies would have to say, recuse ourselves, and not that we're in opposition, but I don't think I'm, you know, so even though I have formally sit on the commission. So just be careful, because even if the commission says something, it might be, well, these five people in the commission, but these people have to abstain or recuse ourselves anyway. That's probably going to get us down to less than a quorum. Yeah. So uh, maybe we should just individually make recommendations as we feel so moved. Yeah, and I think you could probably yeah, indicate yeah. that making the recommendation in my, capa my in personal my capacity as a commission member. Okay. That probably makes more sense. Okay. Um, so if you uh, guys are still okay, I'd like to push on to the recommendations of the research subcommittee. Does anybody need a bio break before we do that, or can I? Okay. 